July was a mad, merry, blissful month when Boston celebrated the 200th birthday of America. It was a festival of songs, ships, and history. There was something special in the air, an essence of times, past, and future. Six months later, there would be another celebration, the second revolution of the New England Patriots. I'm Ed Motz, president of John Hancock. Our company has been here in New England for 115 years, ever since its founding. So we're very happy to sponsor this film about our exciting New England patriots. If you're wondering about that spectacular view in the background, I'm standing on the 60th floor of our observatory, which has been visited by thousands of people since it was first opened to the public. If you haven't been here, you ought to come. And with that, let's turn to look at the Patriots. The Patriots won but three games in 1975, and it seemed a bicentennial ago since they were a bona fide contender. Beneath these harsh facts, there was hard evidence to suggest some reasons for their renaissance. For three years, this team was being rebuilt through the draft. Thus, they were not long in the tooth, but long on young talent. And buttressed by Chuck Fairbanks, the Patriots trim the fat off bodies and minds for a meat grinder of an early schedule. Baltimore, Miami, Pittsburgh, and Oakland were the first four opponents. So their season would be made or lost in the first four weeks. New England lost 27 to 13 to the Colts in the opener. And the future looked bleak indeed until they crushed the Dolphins. 30 to 14 in the second week. Critics tossed aside the victory by calling it luck. A commodity, they said, was sure to desert them against the world champion Pittsburgh Steelers. Indeed, the Patriots trailed Pittsburgh 20 to 9 until quarterback Steve Grogan shattered the steel curtain with two long-range touchdowns. Scores by Russ Francis and Darrell Stingley triggered New England's second straight upset victory, 30 to 27. The question still remained whether the Patriots, after two stunning victories, used magic and illusion instead of offense and defense, or were they for real? The question was answered emphatically one week later, when they played the undefeated Oakland Raiders. What Foxborough witnessed was no mirage, but a team in deep focus, sharp, bright, imaginative, and destined to be reckoned with. The Patriots rolled up 48 points and almost 500 yards in total offense. 300 yards came on the ground as the offensive line chewed up and spat out the Raiders for their running backs. Sam Cunningham gained over 100 yards rushing, added almost 100 more receiving, and opened the heart of the field for some razzle-dazzle by Steve Grogan. Grogan's double value as passer and runner was borne out by his four touchdowns and the 121 team points scored in the first four games. But this was no one-man show, rather a 43-man effort that ran down deep to kicker John Smith and putter Mike Patrick. After three straight victories, visions of the playoffs danced merrily in everyone's head. Over the next five weeks, the Patriots encountered mixed success. They won three and lost two. Once to the Detroit Lions and the rematch with the Dolphins. Two things remained constant. The spirit and desire of the team under Chuck Fairbanks and the development of Steve Grogan into the respected leader of its offense.
Another reason for their surge was a rapidly developing defense, which strung out and nipped a running attack in the bud and harassed superstars into foolhardy and impetuous acts. An almost forgotten aspect outside of New England was the special teams, a unit that broke the backs and spirits of their opponents with game-breaking plays. Behind the special teams and Steve Grogan's runs, the Patriots defeated the Bills twice in three weeks and buried the Jets 41-7 on Monday night. After the Jet game, Grogan said, it felt good to run. I just ran until somebody caught me. The only thing that touched Grogan was the stadium wall as he rushed for 103 yards. His fans were called Grogan's heroes. And with the Patriots' record of 6-3, and three, his name became synonymous with their success. This second-year quarterback from Kansas State, though modest and reserved, is not as corny as Kansas in August. He leads by example and goes where most quarterbacks fear to tread, just like he did in high school and college. You know, football is a physical game, and, and I've always played it physically, and I just try to get excited and go out and play as hard as I can and do everything I can to help us win. I like to run. I've run for a long time, ever since I was in high school, and it's just something that comes natural to me, and I feel like I'm adding a little more to our offense and contributing a little more than just handing the ball off and letting everybody else do the work, so I kind of enjoy it. Unlike most quarterbacks, Grogan runs not out of desperation, but as the third runner in the Patriot backfield. In effect, the offense has a triple option, with Grogan as its triple threat. Grogan's imposing natural abilities are self-evident. Sturdy legs and a strong arm. What he learned was touch. When to feather a pass or flat-out drill it. The Patriots' record stood at 6-3, and three, and their stretch drive for a playoff berth began in Baltimore, where they faced the AFC Eastern leaders, the Colts. During the course of the season, their 3-4 defense had mellowed and matured. Now it was just the right vintage to bottle up the lightning of Lydell Mitchell, number 26. The Patriots limited Mitchell to 52 yards, held Burt Jones to a paltry 95 yards passing, and with the aid of two interceptions by rookie Mike Haynes, reduced the NFL's leading offense to rubble. After chewing up Baltimore, the Patriots swallowed seven interceptions and beat the New York Jets 38 to 24. Every member of the secondary of Fox, McRae, Howard, and Haynes intercepted at least one pass. Prentice McRae stole two and ran both of them back for touchdowns. The Jets were drowned in a flood tide of easy touchdowns as the Patriots won their third in a row. Next, the Denver Broncos were blown away by the strong winds of a Patriot rush, which downed their quarterbacks nine times. This game mirrored Patriot depth at all positions, especially running back. Without Sam Cunningham, Don Calhoun, Andy Johnson, and rookie Ike Forte combined for nearly 350 yards rushing and an imposing 38-14 victory.
New England proved you don't have to be injury-free to make the playoffs if there's a mother load of talent in reserve. When injuries struck down tight end Russ Francis, the Patriots' fifth victory in a row was launched by his replacement, Al Chandler, number 87. Their 27-6 triumph over the New Orleans Saints assured them a place in the playoffs. And in the season's final week, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were left behind in their jet stream 31-14. Andy Johnson skated smoothly for a 69-yard touchdown. And Sam Hunt, not to be outdone, rumbled 68 yards with an interception as the Patriots ended the regular season with their sixth straight victory. All in all, it was one hell of a season. The Patriots broke or tied 43 team and individual records. Not only were they the first winning team since 1966, but they turned the 3-11 and 11 season of a year ago into 11-3, and three, the winningest record in New England Patriot history. Best of all, for the first time in 13 years, the Patriots season had not ended. Like the tortoise and the hare, their goal was to be there at the finish. They were the wild card with a firm grip on the playoffs. My name is Al Gazakian. I'm blind. But I don't sell pencils or play the violin on street corners, and I'm not one of those private eyes you see on TV. I make a good living for my family as the director of administrative systems and research for the John Hancock Mutual Life Insurance Company in Boston. Hi, Sandy. Hi. I can't use my eyes, but I can use my ears, my tongue, and my head. Al Gazagian is not John Hancock's one and only handicapped. Because Hancock wants to help conserve human resources, we've hired 500 talented people who just happen to have a handicap, but who can still turn out a good day's work. John Hancock believes a person should be judged for what he can do, <laughs> not for what he can't do. John Hancock, helping conserve our human resources. John Hancock, good company, concerned citizen. Chuck Fairbanks, along with one of the most creative and hardworking coaching staffs in history, turned losers into winners in the space of 12 short months. The spirit of the New England Patriots was unassailable in 1976. Together with their coach, they held a common bond, the playoffs. Before the season, Chuck Fairbanks' defense was suspect, but they allowed the fewest points in the team's history. Their 3-4 defense was designed to converge at the point of attack, to swarm in packs and waves of tacklers, to overwhelm by sheer numbers. Linebackers Hunt, Zabel, Barnes, King, and number 57, Steve Nelson, roamed the middle zones of the pass defense. The deep defense of Howard, Haynes, Fox, and number 34, Prentice McRae, was the lifeline between touchdowns and turnovers. The Patriot rush line of Mel Lunsford, Raymond Hamilton, Tony McGee, and Julius Adams sacked quarterbacks 47 times. Their strategy was simple. Shove the pass pocket way beyond its normal boundaries and push quarterbacks backward in forced retreat.
Most experts agree that teams are carried to championships on the broad shoulders of their defense. In 1976, the Patriots' first draft choice was Michael Haynes, a cornerback from Arizona State. Like all number one picks, Haynes blitzed into the NFL with salvos of publicity, which hyped him into instant superstardom. Number 40 succeeded when most failed because his helmet was firmly rooted to his head and his fast feet allowed him to outrun the ball. With eight interceptions, the second best in the AFC, and his skills as a return specialist, Haynes became Rookie of the Year, an all-pro, and an exciting star of magnitude. In their 17-year history, no Patriot had returned a punt for a touchdown until Mike Haynes. Like all great athletes, regardless of the sport, Haynes achieves results effortlessly. While Mike Haynes ran with a win, the run was the trademark of the Patriot offense. The line of Sam Adams, Bill Lenkaitis, Leon Gray, Bob McKay, John Hanna, and Tom Neville were the road pavers. Even without a 1,000-yard rusher, they opened holes worth 2,957 yards, the fifth best mark in the history of the NFL. Much of the yardage came off the all-pro left side, manned by number 70, Leon Gray, and number 73, John Hanna. The cross block, a trading off of assignments, was a tactic that often allowed Sam Cunningham a clear route to six points. Following the broad beam of John Hanna, Patriot runners were safer than ships in the night. The Patriots' ground game, once a thin red line, was now a finely tuned racing machine with many replaceable parts. Eight players rushed the football, and 24 times they crossed the goal line. Quarterback Steve Grogan scored 12 rushing touchdowns, the most in NFL history. When the Patriots needed six yards or six points, they slipped the ball to Sam Cunningham. The threat of Cunningham off tackle or a Grogan rollout spread out defenses and opened up the field for number 32, Andy Johnson, a smart, versatile, pick-a-hole runner with unconquerable desire. A.J. gained 700 hard yards and is cut in the mold of Paul Horning. Like Horning, he was a former college quarterback and thus understands his niche in the overall scheme of the offense. While Johnson was solid and dependable from whistle to gun all season, Don Calhoun proved a sunburst of energy in desperate times. Injury canceled Sam Cunningham and his 800 yards, so number 44 stepped in with 700 more of his own and a rushing average that was the highest in pro football. So formidable was the ground attack that it bullied defenses, controlled the clock, 
and allow their air arm to seize the right situation in which to pass. When Patriot receivers gave the old throw-and-go signal to Grogan, the result was 18 touchdowns. Although Patriot receivers did not catch passes in volume, the acrobatics of Randy Vitaha and Darrell Stingley were needed in the clutch. Stingley's 21-yard average and four touchdowns led the receivers, while the good hands of Russ Francis made him an all-pro. The New England Patriots entered the playoffs with so much accomplished, but yet so much more still to do. They combined dominating defense with aggressive offense. And for the first time in recent memory, they dictated to others what they could or could not do. In their minds, and in the hearts at Foxborough, they were number one. Students come here from 46 states and 13 countries, and what they learn can affect your family's life. It's the John Hancock Institute in Boston where many Hancock agents learn the newest changes in life insurance. So you and your family can live the life you want. At Hancock, we never stop learning. Put your John Hancock on a John Hancock for your family, for your family. On December 18th, Oakland resembled one of those tough nightclubs that try out up and coming talent. The auditions are rough the audience even rougher. The Patriots' 48-17 regular season victory was the only blemish on the Raiders' record. So the silver and black were a mad and angry team, bent on harassing, intimidating, and punching out the Patriots. After 15 furious minutes, the Patriots needed dentists and doctors more than draws and screens when Oakland left them bruised, but not broken. The Patriots dug down deep into their spiritual reserves and doled out clean, hard hits, measure for measure. Where there was once hope, there was now a wellspring of confidence. They knew they could do it. So they went out and did it. Three quarters, the Patriots outthought and outfought the future Super Bowl champions and led 21 to 10. There were no mysteries or trick plays, just the culmination of a season of hard work. Early in the fourth quarter, Oakland scored. And with 57 seconds remaining and the Patriots leading 21 17, the Raiders reached their 27. On third and 18, number 71, Raymond Hamilton, was called for roughing Ken Stabler. Instead of an incompleted pass and a fourth and impossible situation, Chuck Fairbanks' team was against the wall with the Raiders at the one. A storm of controversy clouded the scrimmage line. After winning all the battles, the New England Patriots were about to lose the war. Oakland scored with 10 seconds left on the clock. And for the New England Patriots, their dreams were finally and cruelly crushed. They had traveled so far, 
only to fall inches short. There is no reason to dwell on defeat after a season of accomplishment. They played their last game unlike they played their first. They had come in like a lamb and gone out a lion. Their dramatic turnaround from 3 and 11 to 11 and 3 was unprecedented in league history. They will be back because they're young, well coached, and deep. They're the New England Patriots, and they're winners.